usually. For us, as engineer or surveyors, borders are a matter of technical aspects. However, we also understand that borders are also about law, politics, and other social aspects. That is why I appreciate the Department of Geodetic Engineering for the willingness to collaborate with the Faculty of Law, USIM Malaysia. We need such an interdisciplinary collaboration when it comes to border issues. For the Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Gajah Mada, this is the fourth summer course program conducted this year. We are very happy and honored to be the host of more than 150 young people from different countries. We hope you will also manage to make friends among the participants so the event will not end here. You should use this opportunity to build your network. Even though you will learn about borders, it does not mean that you will build borders among you. Instead, we hope you will manage to cross the borders in order to collaborate. This event will remind us that we live in the era of collaboration, not merely competition. Now we kindly request uh, Rector, Professor Panut Mulyono to officially open the summer course. Okay. Thank you very much and have a good and productive event. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Wasis Wildan. Now, please welcome the Rector of Universitas Gajah Mada, Professor Panut Mulyono, to give a speech and officially open the ACL Dream 2021. Pak Rektor, the stage is all yours. Okay, okay thank you so much, Mbak. <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Peace be upon all of us. The Honorable Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Dr. Wasis Wildan, the Honorable Head of the Department of Geodetic Engineering, Dr. Trias Aditya, the Honorable Deputy Dean of Law, USEM Malaysia, Dr. Intan Nadia Gulam Khan, uh, Honorable Professor Cliff Sofield of World Maritime University, Honorable keynote speakers, speakers, my colleague, Dr. Danang Siratmoko, uh, Dr. Imade Andi Arsana, committee, all participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to welcome everybody in this great event about reimagining the borders. Our understanding and imagination about borders keep changing. This event is a good example. On one hand, we think that borders are stronger and we cannot travel that much. On the other hand, we can go anywhere in the world virtually. We can easily meet different people in different countries and continents in a matter of hours or even minutes. Indeed, the topic of this event is real fun. We need to reimagine borders. I understand we have more than 22 professors from different countries and continent. I'm sure that you all will learn these issues from different perspective, so you will manage to gain comprehensive understanding. Border issues are not only about geographical location and fans. It's also about access. Borders are not only a matter of security. It is also about prosperity. Borders are not always about excluding one from another, but also about promoting interaction and collaboration. This is a good example how in reality, 
short period of time, we managed together more than 150 students from around the world in one event. Not only that, collaboration among different scholars is also made possible due to technology and willingness to work together, even though physical mobility is limited. I congratulate the Dean, Department of Head, Head of the Department, and the organizer for the good work. We also thank our colleagues from USCM Malaysia with the leadership of Dr. Khan for such wonderful uh, collaboration. We hope this will not only end here, and this can be the seat for further collaboration. This is the time for us to talk and learn about borders in order for us to go beyond borders. Here, I declare that the summer program of ACL Dream 2021 is officially open. Have a good and productive exchange of ideas, everyone. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Panut Mulyono, as Director of Universitas Gajah Mada for great speech and for officially opening the ACL, ACL Dream 2021. Shortly, we will enter today's main agenda. This section will be hosted by Dr. Imande Andi Arsana. That's true, Chika. Because of that, we would like to thank everyone for joining us in the opening ceremony of ACL Dream 2021. And now we will pass the session to Pak Andi. Pak Andi, the stage is all yours. Thank you for a very nice uh, host of this uh, event. Uh, Pak Rektor, Matunun, thank you very much for... Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. Pak Dekan, thank you very much. Pak Was you're welcome. Yeah. Pak Dekan, thank you very much also. Uh, Dr. Intan, thank you very much. Really appreciate your presence here, even though only virtually. I hope uh, next year you can come here in person, <laughs> Dr. Intan. Also, I'd like to uh, say hello to my mentor, my teacher, my colleague, uh, Clive Schofield. Clive, how are you? Uh, I, I can see you're wearing batik there, Clive, so thank you very much for <laughs> it. I am. Thank, thank you, Andy. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be, to be with you. Uh, thank you ever so much for the invitation. Pleasure. Okay, thank you, and Prof. Lee. I'm wearing the batik <laughs> that you bought for me. Great, great. Thank you so much, Prof. Lee. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. But you, you should say thank you after after I've spoken, not before. You don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> you may not like it. Uh, okay. <laughs> you like it. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Gentlemen, allow me before I give the opportunity to... Uh, allow me just to call a Clive Clive without Professor Scofield because we are close and I think this is how we usually do in Australia. We usually address people by uh, calling uh, his or her first name, right? I hope you're okay with that. Uh, but before we allow Clive to present to us, um, I would also once again thank uh, Pak Rektor, Pak Dekan, uh, Pak Kadep, and also Ibu Intan. Thank you very much also for everything, for all your support. Uh, uh, if you have anything to do, like because I know you're very busy, okay. so I think it would be you know, like acceptable if you uh, leave the meeting. But if you, you would like to stay, certainly we'll be very happy to have you around us. Now, before uh, I uh, we talk or we listen to uh, uh, Doctor, uh, sorry, Professor Clive Scofield, allow me to uh, present to you the participant about uh, what uh, we can or what we are going to expect in this program. So allow me, I have only three or four slides here. I hope you're okay with me. Uh, first, once again, this is the collaboration between uh, UGM and USIM. Once again, thank you very much. I would like to say hello to my friend, Dr. Hasmi. Hasmi, are you around? Just say hello to everybody, please. <laughs> All right, Hasmi, Hasmi will, be, will be here with us. Yes, 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 I'm around, I'm around, I'm around. Hello, everyone. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much, hello. Hasmi. I did. No worries. The collaboration between UGM and USIM, thank you very much. Also, in collaboration with other universities, as mentioned earlier, uh, it is 
it is uh, very surprising in my opinion because we we prepared this in a relatively short period of time. Uh, we receive actually around 200 participants registration and also 222 professors as I as we mentioned earlier uh, coming from 11 countries altogether. So this is the maps. Uh, uh, I'm not really sure how I should put five here whether Sweden or Australia or UK, but just uh, <laughs> make it just like that. <laughs> All right. Um, and the next will be, this is the, the gender balance in the participants. I think you can see it here. Uh, we have more uh, uh, female flags. So this is very interesting. <laughs> we have more female, yeah. <laughs> and then um, what uh, you guys will receive uh, out of this program is first, you'll receive a certificate uh, signed by both Gajamada and Yusin, which I think is a good, good for you. Also a transcript uh, detailing what you will take during the class, basically the 22 from 22 professors here. So those are what, what you'll receive. And you will need to do is that uh, we don't want to uh, make it like a very hard, a very complicated or difficult program, no. But at least I think it is good for us to learn something and to uh, basically uh, archive something out of this uh, program. So that's why we will ask you to do a very simple, uh, two simple individual assignments, which is actually posting in the social media, uh, something that you really like, right? Some posting in social media about what uh, you are going to attend here or what you are going to learn. Okay, that's first. And sec uh, the, the second one will be, or the third assignment will be a one group presentation. So after this, we are going to assign you in the group. Uh, we are making sure that the group will consist of people from different countries. So because this is uh, what the, the program is for, to make you making friends and also good attendance. You have to be in a good attendance in order for you to get all of this uh, certificate. Now, the last thing is that you will have a, a quite uh, interesting, also a culture. It is not a performance, so uh, I hope you don't expect uh, us to dance or anything, but basically we will present to you the beauty and the colorful and the also diversity of uh, cultures in ASEAN and, and around. So I think this will be an additional value also uh, to you during this, uh, this uh, program. Uh, with that, I'll just stop here. Thank you very much once again for the participant. And uh, now I would like to talk a little bit uh, to uh, Clive. Uh, uh, it is actually, uh, I don't know, uh, we haven't seen each other for quite some time, so maybe close to three years, Clive. So thank you very much once again. Uh, the last time I saw you was in Sweden. Uh, based in the World Maritime University. It was 2018, I remember. Uh, and now, uh, just a little story uh, to everybody. Uh, Klaus Kofil is my, in Indonesia, we call it guru. Guru is teacher. It is more than teacher, actually. So uh, I actually was introduced to this field, this very fascinating field of maritime boundaries uh, by uh, Clive back in 2004 when I started to study uh, master degree at UNSW. Thank you very much. Well, I will not uh, forget the, uh, how you <laughs> uh, gave me not only knowledge, but also uh, personal touch. Uh, this is basically how you teach, uh, how we should uh, actually build a connection and build uh, collaboration among uh, teacher and also students. So I think this is the value that I, I really appreciate. Now, uh, Clive has been working extensively in the in the field of borders and especially maritime boundaries uh, been involved in different cases and also different uh, projects so now i think it is a, a great pleasure for us to listen to your wisdom about the uh, borders issue Clive. so i think uh, the time is now yours uh, maybe i'm not really sure like one hour or so uh, take your time thank you very much Clive. thank you very much indeed andy for that warm introduction and i uh, whilst I'm getting set up here, Please. if Zoom cooperates, um, I would very much, very sincerely like to thank the the organisers for the the opportunity to to join you um, and to to help launch the the summer school. It's a really exciting program, um, and uh, I haven't had very long to to put together this particular introduction, but I, I hope some of the themes uh, that I'm going to talk about mm. will in a way provide thoughts on that you should carry through the, the entire summer school because there are there are overarching issues related to reimagining or borders or 
I, I, I like to think of it as almost borders redux. Uh, that, is, that is coming back again, the functions of, of that, and the need to, to reimagine constantly how we divide the world. And uh, I will say from the outset that uh, I be taking a, a viewpoint that is informed by my own journey. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that over time, I gradually drifted offshore. Uh, so that I originally started uh, at the looking at border issues uh, in my undergraduate and then into my, my PhD studies, uh, joining the International Boundaries Research Unit in the University of Durham in the UK, uh, and dealing with both land, maritime, and also airspace uh, and outer space boundaries. Uh, but over time, I've gradually drifted offshore. So many of the examples I'm going to, to use uh, are more maritime or ocean oriented than they are uh, mm. terrestrial, but many of the themes hopefully are applicable across uh, both terrestrial and maritime. One of the key themes, I think it's fair to say that I, I want you to keep questioning in the course of the summer school is the contending issues of stability of international boundaries mm. and the changes mm that the planet as a whole is undergoing. And in terms of that, that's in terms, particularly in terms of environmental and geographical change as the climate crisis deepens. Um, but looking at the program, there's a strong law and policy dimension to the summer school. Uh, and that's, I think, entirely appropriate. I am a geographer by initial training so I see things in a more spatially oriented at the same time I have spent uh, and I apologize to some of my distinguished legal professor colleagues who are listening to me I've spent perhaps too much time for my health uh, in the, in the company of lawyers um, and as a consequence of that I've ended up with a with a law degree as well um, so I, I think of myself my approach as geo-legal combining a multi type approach and I'd urge you to think try and think in interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary terms you can see from the program that it brings together multiple disciplines multiple perspectives on the issue of borders and how we we treat borders in a changing world and what I'd also like to touch on in that in the course of the next uh, little while is issues around technological change and how that can impact on uh, how we deal with international boundaries. So predominantly I take a maritime lens, but applicable also to, to land. I think as has been said in the, uh, the briefing note for the, the summer school, which I suspect Andy has been responsible for drafting, he, he said a couple of things that the, the way in which the pandemic has led, led to a reassertion on the, the barrier function of boundaries, I think that's profoundly true. And therefore you have a reassertion of a very traditional role for borders. One which counters the borderless world thesis uh, more on that, we see many more lines, many more borders into the future. And a fundamental point there, I think, is we are increasingly called on to manage space uh, and indeed to conserve space. And we usually do so by drawing lines and defining areas. Most management options that we have at our disposal are, are bounded they are contained and defined in in spatial terms not all many of many are thematic also uh, uh, asserting governance over particular uh, activities for example but often it's where those activities take place that is crucial to their management the legal uh, dimension in terms of what laws apply or regulation applies to a particular activity depends often on where it takes place so the boundaries, both internationally and domestically, do matter. 
Now, when the borderless world thesis or idea first was proposed, my own uh, PhD supervisor, and here we should say, here, here we have a, a, a hierarchy or a, or a schematic, if you will. Uh, I was Andy's uh, PhD supervisor. I'm now referring back to my own PhD supervisor, Professor Gerald Blake, the founding director of the International Boundaries Research Unit. And his immediately response to that borderless world idea was, well, he didn't actually say rubbish. He used a um, terminology that I'm not, not allowed to write down on a, on a, uh, on a keynote presentation uh, uh, PowerPoint. He was uh, more, um, shall we say, industrial in his language. Uh, and he, he thought it was a rubbish idea. Uh, it, it was simply not the case. Right. There are profound impacts, of course, from globalization. And we have all of the discussion around the free movement of people, of mm -hmm. capital, of finance, of money, free movement, uh, huge advances in communications and technological advances, which we'll talk about in a, a little while. Well, yes, but at the moment in the pandemic, we have a, a major reassertion of the barrier function of borders, at least for people, maybe not for information or for trade. And my own experience uh, in a couple of ways on that. Firstly, my journey to you this week from Malmö in Sweden and just for once, uh, for a brief period of the year, my backdrop uh, in terms of, uh, terms of a blue sky and sunshine is actually true. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't, uh, doesn't happen for all the year, as Andy knows when he came to visit me. Um, but from <laughs> here, uh, I, on Wednesday, I was in Hamburg. Uh, yesterday, I was in Hanoi. And today, now, I'm in uh, Jogjakarta. Um, <laughs> In the, in the brief, it was a, it's common for professors to be in two or three locations in a, in a week and teaching and teaching all of the, the, the hours across the, the time zones. That's profoundly true. And what I would say is that there has been a proliferation of webinars uh, across the planet and you can be presenting. I've never traveled so much in the last 18 months without going anywhere. Um, so... That is the case, um, but physically, I'm now on the verge of getting on a plane, hopefully on Sunday, to head to Australia, um, and that has proved extremely hard to do. However, global supply chains, trade, often predominantly carried by sea, has stood up. We, we have still been able to have the, um, the trade across the planet in a way that has sustained the global economy um, and that those logistical networks have by and large um, proved to be quite robust. There uh, have been shortages of, of, of certain things and delays in delivery of items. But in my own journey with my family back to Australia, uh, in actual fact, everything we, we really possess, uh, except in the suitcase, is currently somewhere on a ship in the Indian Ocean. So it made, we, we have to think positively, it made it through the Suez Canal, <laughs> which was not always the case earlier this year. Uh, and it's made it through the Gulf of Aden uh, with uh, no pirate uh, uh, onboarding, as far as I'm aware. I'm tracking the ship, not the container. So who knows? Um, but ultimately, the supply chains are holding up. A trade is going on. And indeed, uh, our family dog, which uh, when he's standing on his back legs, he's slightly taller than Andy, as he knows, then he has made it back to Australia already. Oh. Um, and he only had to do 10 days of quarantine, whereas we have to do 14. So, you know, I'm not sure the system is entirely working from my point of view. <laughs> Nevertheless, we have uneven impacts of the, the pandemic. Mm. And that has implications for how we we try and critically look at the, the issue of reimagining borders. In some ways, we don't need to reimagine borders. We need to just go back to the past about previous functions. But when, under the pace of technological change, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more later about how we deal with change, technological for sure, but also other types of change, particularly where that change is 
are exponential in character. We struggle with that idea. We tend to think quite narrowly and in a linear fashion. We struggle with how change can occur extremely rapidly, which is why technological changes, the advent of a new in invention, when it's adopted, it can take us by surprise how rapidly that can occur. One element of change I wanted to underscore, and it's, it's you will probably, all of you have heard of the release of the latest report of the, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, this is actually just one component of the IPCC's uh, sixth assessment report, AR6. You can see from the, the, the text on the left, uh, the physical science basis, which was published um, this month, um, is only phase one. And then we get reports scheduled for February 22 uh, on impacts, adaption and vulnerability, then mitigation of climate change in March 22, 2022. And then finally, a synthesis report, which is due in September of 2022. So AR6 is coming. The physical science basis is frankly scary. Um, and what you can see if you are willing to read the IPCC reports, this latest component of AR6 is 3,949 pages long. And that's just one part of it. Um, <laughs> all of the, the, the successive assessment reports, they gradually paint a progressively bleaker and bleaker and more worrying scenario. Um, if uh, we'll, we'll come to the issue of, of climate change inspired sea level rise a little bit later in the discussion, but if you track the projections of sea level rise, the first assessment report projected a, a sea level rise um, uh, of, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, of the order of 19 centimeters. This latest physical science basis on the basis of high emissions scenarios, so the top of the emissions range, which really translates into business as usual, what we are, have currently been doing, then you're looking at uh, of the order of two meters by the end of 2100, by the end of this century, and by 2150, up to five meters of sea level rise. So, you know, as the science basis improves and our projections improve, we get a finer grained analysis of uh, what is the likely or very likely uh, or virtually certain outcomes, and we get the various uh, assessments of probability uh, uh, that the IPCC uses, and increasingly worrying is the, the real takeaway from that. And what that means is that there are, from our point of view, what will borders look like in this scenario of a deepening climate crisis? Because if we look just at the headline uh, statements from the IPCC's latest report, and I admit I haven't read the 3,949 pages, and not every one, certainly, but there is no doubt, it's unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere and therefore also the ocean and the land. The scale is unprecedented over centuries to thousands of years, and those impacts are going to be felt in every region around the world. At the same time as that's that sweeping statement about every region, it won't be felt evenly. You will see spatial and temporal uneven application. So you can have a scenario where you, some regions will not feel the, the violence of climate change inspired um, impacts to the same extent as others, but some regions won't for just feel the, re the average, they'll feel extreme impacts. What is inevitable is that under every emission scenario, temperature 
globally is going to increase into the future. Many of these changes are locked in. Um, there is a compounding element, a combination of different factors leading to extremes. So we may well see in highly like likelihood of increasing intensity and frequency of extreme weather events at the same time as having considerable variability. And many of these changes are irreversible. This is a really, really depressing way to start the Summer Academy. Um, but it is a, this is likely the context for all of our considerations on reimagining borders is all of our future thinking around the function of boundaries and how the legal dimensions apply to it, how new technologies uh, are to be applied in border definition, delimitation and management into the future, have this as a context. Now, the IPCC also looks at uh, not just how the climate is and how the climate is projected, but also looks at the uh, risk assessment and uh, thoughts on how we might in the future try to um, change our behavior uh, to try and address this crisis uh, without dictating terms to governments. It's up to governments to come up with policy. We very recently had a, a uh, senior, um, the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, essentially saying, well, the IPCC needs to come up with, with what we need to do as governments, which abdicates, to my mind, the responsibility that politicians actually have to make policy. That's why they are elected. Uh, the IPCC's role, these are scientists, their role is to provide the fact, the science-based evidence, which feeds into policy. It's ultimately up to governments and international collaboration between governments, um, for example, under global processes like the UN uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals as an overarching framework for action towards sustainable development. And indeed, the recently initiated um, Ocean Decade, for sustainable development, decade of ocean science. All of this is in order to enable governments to address these issues. But coming back to the IPCC's uh, latest report, you'll look likely to see concurrent and multiple changes and impacts. And this is what makes it so hard to project with specificity because you have so many factors involved for example, for sea level rise, we'll see later on that it's not down to a single factor causing sea level rise. It's down to the ocean warming and also because of the atmosphere warming, the melting of grounded ice in ice caps and glaciers, and also our anthropogenic uh, interventions in terms of changing land use, uh, which also have an impact on changing sea level. It's also the case that whilst there are catastrophic potential outcomes that are of low likelihood, such as the uh, breakup of the major ice sheets on Greenland in Antarctica. Uh, so for example, if Greenland ice sheet alone was to break up and melt, that's between six and seven meters of global sea level rise right there. Now, it, this is a huge, inert, static body of ice. But you can see that only a marginal percentage of change can have consequences on a global scale. And those extreme outcomes, such as the for Northern Europe, where I am currently, Sweden and Scandinavia are temperate and livable in large part thanks to the North Atlantic uh, circulatory system. If we break the system of ocean circulation, 
then Northern Europe becomes much, much colder and harder to live in. And that kind of grand scale change is not considered likely or highly likely, but it can't be ruled out. Ultimately, in terms of what to do, it's clear that restraining carbon dioxide emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions, such as methane, is the key way forward. But the depressing part of that is that even if we go uh, and look at the lowest emission scenarios that the IPCC looks at, we're still going to see major, major changes into the future. And some of those main changes will include uh, the melting of ice caps and glaciers, the reduction of, of snow cover in, in uh, high latitudes. We've already seen the warming of, of the oceans. Uh, the la I think the last six years have been the highest temperature on average in the oceans on record. Increasing frequency and intensity of extreme weather events I mentioned, the variability, certainly biodiversity loss, and the changing distribution of species, uh, and that has implications for uh, our border concerns. Uh, I'll give you one example of that. The, um, the International Court of Justice, when it uh, assisted in the uh, ruled on the delimitation between uh, Denmark on behalf of Greenland and Norway on behalf of the small island of, of Jan Mayen uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, rarely for the ICJ, they took into account the presence of fisheries in the area to be divided between the two states. Well, the fish aren't, that fish stock isn't there anymore. It's, it's migrated north into, war, in, into, into uh, Arctic waters away from the area that were, uh, was divided. So because of the, the distribution of the species is shifting with climate change. There are arguably some silver linings to this. The reduction of ice cover in the Arctic has the potential to radically transform global navigation routes. Uh, this is still in the early days, uh, but certainly the, the use of the Northern Sea Route, that is uh, the route uh, to the north of uh, the Russian Federation, uh, and the Northwest Passage north of Canada and the United States in uh, Alaska, increasing use of those routes, increasing uh, window of navigation in the Northern summer. So those changes provide opportunity as well as negatives. Um, the, from a boundaries point of view though, what you will see almost inevitably is increasing pressure on food security on li people's livelihoods, on the, on the habitability of drier, increasingly dry, increasingly hot parts of the land. And as a consequence of that, you can foresee major displacement of population and also movement of population across boundaries. And there are major impacts that are highly likely in terms of impacts on maritime limits, baselines, limits, and boundaries, which we'll come to a little while later. Right. Um, I think it's also fair to say uh, at the outset that it is the developing countries, the global south, that will feel these impacts more severely than anywhere else. Um, fundamentally, that's to do with vulnerability of being in tropical areas particularly, plus limited capacity to actually adapt to change. So that is likely to widen inequalities between North and South. Um, and we'll see the developing countries experiencing those border related issues such as forced migration across boundaries. Many of the developing states in the world, and this, to be fair, this doesn't mean just developing states. We've had a very long-term trend, both towards movement from interior to the coast and from highland to the coast. So with the concentration of 
urbanization of population on the coastline has accelerated over time. And that's where that's where we like to live. That's where our highest value infrastructure is. It's where our mega cities are located, many of them. And I, I took one quote from the World Economic Forum Global Risks Report. The global risks are intensifying, but the collective will to tackle them appears to be lacking. Divisions are hardening. And that you can see that dynamic in the context of the current pandemic, the way in which um, vaccines do no boundaries. So 88% of the vaccines that have been being produced are in the richer countries. Look at the, the rollout of vaccines in Africa as an example. The vast majority of African states will miss the target for vaccinations at the end of this year. And that target was 10%. So nowhere near where it needs to be for, uh, I, I've forgotten what normal actually is, but any kind of version of new normal requires everyone to be vaccinated or at least every country to be at 80 odd percent fully vaccinated. And you can see the, the inequalities that have occurred on access to vaccination for to, to vaccines. And I think you will we will likely see the same kind of inequalities played out in responses to climate change. Now, as a geographer, and uh, I, I, I term myself as in Australian terms a bush lawyer, or maybe a seaweed lawyer at this point. It is fair to say that in international legal terms, international boundaries have a long-standing privileged position under the international law of treaties. It, it's, it's not too hard to work out why. Uh, the international law regimes arising in the aftermath of two world wars privilege the idea of no territorial grabs, of stability in international boundaries with a view to aiding uh, peace and a peace in the uh, no return to the type of destructive global conflicts that we saw in the past. So international boundaries under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties are, should, should not change, are stable, re even regardless of fundamental change of circumstance. So the legal principle here, particularly where a boundary has been agreed or decided upon through judicial means, is pactus sunt savanda, or agreements that you've made must be kept. So two states can agree a boundary, and if both uh, consent to it, they can change the location of the boundary by mutual consent, but a boundary, an international boundary cannot be changed unilaterally. But in the context of the climate crisis, what happens in a maritime context what if we have a maritime boundary, a high elevation island on one side, a low elevation island providing the base points on the other side of the line, and the low elevation island suddenly eventually becomes uninhabitable or is entirely inundated by the ocean and becomes a subsurface feature? Will the boundary still survive under those circumstances? Well, the one case I'd probably highlight, and I'll come back to this later uh, as well, is the one case where instability of the coastline as a consequence of climate change was actually overtly raised by Bangladesh in the context of an arbitration with India concerning their maritime boundaries. And there, the tribunal came out with the statement that maritime delimitations like land boundaries must be stable and definitive to ensure the peaceful relationship between the states concerned in the long term. So that argues that that long-standing fundamental stability of agreed maritime and land boundaries, it applies both to maritime as well as to land. Now we'll come back to that case uh, in a, a little while in terms of the actual instability in the, the coastline. 
But what I'd like to do now is venture offshore and look at the impacts, some of the impacts of climate change inspired sea level rise on uh, what is the border between land and sea. That is baselines along the coast. And I have to immediately credit and thank uh, Dr. Asana for the fantastic graphics, which he is so adept at producing. Uh, the, here we have the zonal system of maritime claims, all measured from baselines, territorial sea contiguous zone, exclusively zone, 12, 24, and 200 nautical miles, all measured from baselines along the coast. So that's why baselines are important. It gets more complex in terms of the continental shelf limits beyond 200 nautical miles from the coast, but nonetheless, breadth limits from baselines are critical. Now, in the maritime world, the extension of claims offshore uh, has been quite rapid and quite recent. Uh, up until the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was drafted, and it was drafted between 1973 and 1982, finalized in 1982 and opened for signature then, so relatively recent, um, so 40 odd years ago. We're in a situation there prior to 1982 of there not being any agreement or any codification of the breadth even of the territorial sea. So one of the triumphs of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, to my mind, is spatial. It's a framework of maritime zones that are measured by predominantly breadth criteria, breadth distance limits measured from baselines. And the consequence of the introduction, particularly of the exclusive economic zone, out to a 200 nautical mile limit from baselines is probably the biggest shift in property rights globally from an international regime of the high seas to national claims to sovereign rights over the EEZ. Not full sovereignty, but sovereign rights for particular purposes and primarily marine resource purposes. So think. Traditionally, think fish, think oil and gas. That means if every coastal state claims out to 200 nautical miles, about 41% of the oceans is covered by national claims of one sort or another. And then the um, continental shelf areas for states sitting on broad continental margins uh, of the order of 37 million square kilometers further of a so-called outer or extended continental shelf areas beyond 200 mile limits. The result of that extension of claims offshore has been a proliferation of overlapping maritime claims and therefore a proliferation of potential new maritime boundaries because we have states that were 400 nautical miles away from one another if they're within 400 nautical miles of one another, suddenly they require a, an exclusive economic zone boundary. So this is the kind of scenario. You have a, a mainland state, and again, Andy, Andy is the wizard on the, these uh, animation, animations, uh, an offshore state composed of islands. You may have a, a big islands offshore. You may have some, uh, we could go into much more detail on types of baseline, including straight baselines, uh, bay closing lines and so forth, archipelagic uh, baselines. Uh, and I know that archipelagic states issues will be coming up uh, uh, during the academy. Um, generate to 12, 24, 200 nautical mile limits. Whoa, lo, lo and behold, what you thought was a, a neighbor within the region, but not your actual neighbor requiring a boundary, suddenly you have an overlapping exclusive economic zone claims, and potentially a new maritime boundary to delimit. So that relatively recent advent of these broader maritime claims has led to a proliferation in the number of potential boundaries, and of course, surprise, surprise, of boundary disputes. Now, in the boundaries world, you will probably come across someone who will quote from uh, Robert Frost's poem called Mending Wall, uh, the quotation that good fences make good neighbors. I think that's fine. I think it's a good quotation. I rather like um, 
a quote attributed to Benjamin Frank Franklin that you should love that you love your neighbor, but don't pull down your hedge. We still need borders as a means to define the rights and obligations between countries, between states, um, as to who can do what and where. Uh, and that remains important because even with the influence of globalization, which is profound, nonetheless, we're still in an international system which is state-led, which is state-dominated. So the advantage of having a boundary, certainly in the maritime sphere, is it provides clarity and certainty to states and to, to users. And this kind of concept is broad and applies to land boundaries also. States prefer unilateral regimes. They want control over their territory. And they may well give up elements of that sovereignty when they become part of a broader regional institution like the European Union, as an example. Um, it's fair to say that the Law of the Sea Convention, because it was a creation of states, gives states the primary role. So you need to be a coastal state in order to assert claims to maritime space. And you do so from the baselines along the edge of your territory. To be a state, you need territory. Under the Montevideo Convention on the Rights of States, you need a defined area of territory. So you could make the argument that in ecosystem terms, Dividing up the oceans and indeed the land into separate states it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, your political boundaries don't fit your ecosystem boundaries, your natural boundaries. Yet it is the predominant way that we are dealing with land and maritime space. I would say that the definition of boundaries, they provide or the delimitation of boundaries, the delineation of the outer limits of maritime claims. They provide that critical degree of confidence, of certainty and stability. At the same time, they're the only, only the starting point for management efforts. Uh, it, to my mind, the, 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 the worst advice you, you could get from an international lawyer is to go to court. Um, a court or a tribunal will deliver you a line. Uh, however, it's the re you are still left with a negotiation with your neighboring uh, uh, neighboring state in order to manage the resources, manage the ecosystems that inevitably are transboundary, uh, which will straddle whatever artificial political line you draw on the map. So, on the maritime side. Uh, I would say we have still have a long, long way to go. You can open up an atlas and you see generally a pretty familiar network of often bold red lines for the land boundaries between states. Now, this is not to say that the political map of the world isn't dynamic and it does change over time. And the, the the breakup of Sudan with South Sudan gaining independence is probably the re most recent example of that. But, you know, the breakup of uh, former Yugoslavia, the breakup of the, the Soviet Union um, provide for changes in the land boundary network that you see on in the atlas and on the map. What you generally see in atlases is a beautiful blue sweep of, uh, of ocean without lines. And partially, I think that's because of the complexity of the different types of zone that uh, we illustrated a moment ago, but also to do with the fact that the maritime delimitation network is so incomplete. So only a little over half of the potential maritime boundaries globally actually have an agreement in force related to it, to each of those potential maritime boundaries. And many of those maritime boundaries are incomplete. They either are, they only deal with part of the potential length of the line, or the early agreements prior to 1982 only deal with the continental shelf and not the water column, prior to the concept of the exclusive economic zone being codified. 
So overall, it's a very young process, and that's why fundamentally you have so many under-limited maritime boundaries. I wanted to come back to the IPCC projections and uh, climate change impacts on the ocean, and particularly in terms of sea level rise, because uh, that can have a, a major impact on that uh, land sea interface at the coast and therefore the location of baselines and therefore the limits of maritime claims and maritime boundaries. Now, the projections for sea level rise have grown over time, but there are many caveats associated, associated that, is, that is, there are many um, uh, articulations of reasons for doubt of uncertainty over the actual projections. And it's so hard to project with confidence because there are so many factors involved. The primary ones to take account of are heat. That is, the oceans act as our primary sink, our primary absorber of our excess heat uh, and also our excess carbon dioxide. So the heat impacts the oceans and sea level rise in two ways. Firstly, about 50% of global mean sea level rise is attributable to thermal expansion. That is, if you take a liquid, uh, a, a pot of water on your stove, heat it up, it will expand. And the same principle applies to the oceans. Global atmospheric temperatures have risen. Much of that heat has been absorbed by the oceans. The ocean temperature has risen, and as a consequence, the oceans take up more space. They have expanded. And so long as you keep the, the basin of, that the ocean sits in static, which is not the case, um, then you will see sea level rise. Now, uh, One of the ways in which um, the ocean basins change is through tectonic mo movements, through um, shifts in the ocean plates, uh, geomorphological changes in the, the coastline also. So for example, the, the Boxing Day tsunami had devastating impact in the, the states, including Indonesia, bordering the, the Indian Ocean. At the same time, uh, it impacted on the, the plate, at the plate boundary, a shift of a couple of meters in vertically was the primary causation of the tsunami and also led to the, as far as I recall, formation of new insular features uh, belonging to Indonesia. So you can have a major change in the shape or of the, the ocean basins can impact on the sea level. But really the two primary aspects are thermal expansion, but also because of the higher uh, atmospheric temperatures, the melting of grounded ice, particularly from glaciers, but also from ice sheets, particularly those ice sheets located on land. So whilst uh, the Arctic ice cap, which is floating, has gradually reduced radically in, in recent years, it hasn't actually impacted on sea level rise uh, to a great degree. What has mattered is the contribution from what was ice on land melting and flowing into the ocean and thereby ex increasing the volume of water in the oceans. So key uh, drivers, um, the melting of glaciers and ice caps uh, and the thermal expansion of the oceans, and then the figures six to seven meters of sea level rise locked up in Greenland, and at least 60 meters of global sea level rise uh, locked up in the ice in Antarctica. This is not to argue that the, this is an imminent, uh, we're gonna see imminent um, collapse of ice sheets because they are enormous static bodies of water, but it is a fluid system. Um, and those catastrophic changes have not been ruled out by the IPCC. It is also a, um, an issue that 
what we perceive sometimes, what we think of as sea level rise actually isn't. Um, Manila is a good example of this, as is Jakarta, uh, whereby subsidence of the land is at least as much, if not more, of a problem than actual rising sea levels. We certainly have major flooding events in Manila, but also in, in Jogja, uh, sorry, in Jakarta, uh, as a consequence, in part at least, from the removal of fluids from the water table, usually for drinking, water for drinking, plus also building a city on a delta of a river and therefore the soft sediments being compacted and squashed by all of the concrete we put on top. And as a result of that, uh, some studies have put the subsidence uh, in Jakarta as of the uh, order of three meters, two to three meters. And as a consequence of that, what we think of as flooding as a result of sea level rise, in fact, is mainly caused by subsidence. In high latitudes, particularly where I am now in sunny Sweden, um, we have issues to do with glacial isostatic readjustment. And where I am, it's, it's uh, an issue of rebound. When the, at the last glacial maximum, enormous volumes of ice were located where I am, uh, which accounts for the fact that uh, where I am has virtually no hills whatsoever. It's been scoured flat by previous ice sheets. Once the ice sheets melt and are removed in warmer temperatures or warmer climate, um, the solid earth, the mantle will flow back and there will be a rebound effect. At the edge of at the ice sheets, where the ice sheets were, the mantle will have flowed in and pushed the land up. So with the removal of the ice sheets, then you'll see a fall. So for example, the Hudson's Bay area of Canada, uh, that is a low elevation, shallow gradient coastline on the Hudson's Bay. And as a consequence of glacial isostatic rebound, the land is rising and that's outpacing any sea level change. So you're seeing an extension, more land emerging year on year. Even though that pace of isostatic rebound is of the, the order of one centimeter a century, still it has an impact. In contrast, New York, where New York is located, is on the fore bulge. So you're actually seeing not only sea level rise impacts, but also a drop in the physical underpinnings of New York. Another aspect and a complexity in this and a, a, a source of uh, variability in sea level change is that the ice sheets themselves, these massive bodies of ice, they have mass. Therefore, they have gravitational attraction. Um, so we have what's called a fingerprinting effect. The mass of the ice draws the ocean near to it towards the ice. If you reduce or remove the ice and the mass, gravitational attraction lessens. Therefore, if the Greenland ice sheet were to melt, you would likely see uh, a fall in the sea level in those areas closest to Greenland which is, is a, a concept which is, is a, a little bit hard to uh, get a, a hold of, that you will potentially see sea level fall as well as sea level rise. The central message from the IPCC report, though, is that we are seeing an acceleration in the rate of sea level rise. You can see the most recent period from 2006 to 2018, uh, that was that three times, previous rate of 1.3 up to 3.7 millimeters per year. We're only talking millimeters, but millimeters add up. What is also crucial, critical to understand is that sea level is committed to rise for centuries to millennia. This is not a problem we can easily eradicate and make uh, disappear. 
I mentioned at the start that um, the projections from the IPCC have got, over time, have become more and more dire. The projection for the do nothing, high emission scenario, business as usual scenario, is that global mean sea level rise could mount to of the order of two meters by 2100 and up to five meters by 2150. Now the confidence on these projections is limited, but nonetheless, these are really quite scary figures, um, particularly for states with broad areas that are low elevation, low gradient, with millions of people living on them. Bangladesh is a good example of that. Uh, large parts of the Indian littoral or coastline um, Vietnam uh, and the Mekong Delta, um, you already have over a million people in the Mekong Delta living below sea level now. Um, so these are some of the most vulnerable areas for uh, inundation, particularly when you have a higher base for global sea level added to increased frequency and intensity of storms of extreme weather events and off that base, higher base of sea level, then you will see enhanced inundation of the coast. Now, from a point of view of boundaries, uh, baselines, boundaries and limits, this is a typical Swedish coastline. Thanks to Andy for that graphic. Um, the concern is that if your baseline is consistent with the coast, with the low water line along the coast, as sea level rises, you will have inundation of the coastline. So your land will go backwards, the edge of your land will retreat, the coastline will retreat, and you'll not only lose areas of coast, which of course is where we like to live, where we have concentrations of population and high value infrastructure, but also there will be impacts offshore. So the usual way in which we delineate the outer limits to maritime claims is through the so-called envelope of arcs. We use the outermost parts of the coastline, the headlands, most protuberant seaward parts of the land in order to maximize our maritime claims. And this could be a 12 mile limit, it could be a 200 nautical mile limit, the principle is the same. We join up the outer arcs of those uh, sweep, sweeping arcs that we showed to make up an envelope of arcs. Now, we have known for a very long time that coastlines are dynamic. They change over time. Um, that, that dynamism of coastlines as a features of the land, but also seascape, means that we're used to the idea of the baseline along the coast, the traditional interpretation under international law of the sea, is that the baseline is ambulatory. Um, I like the word, it, it gives the impression of the baseline wandering around, the coastline shifting and moving over time. And that does occur. So you may be lucky, you may have deposition along your coastline, for example, and that means you gain more land territory under your sovereignty, and you also potentially gain additional areas of maritime jurisdiction. And that matters, of course, because within those maritime spaces, you as the coastal state have sovereignty or sovereign rights over the valuable marine resources within those spaces. With climate change inspired sea level rise, our fear is that we will see increased inundation of the coastline. What I should say is there are caveats here around looking specifically at particular parts of the coastline and how the coastline reacts uh, and there are feedbacks between uh, the shape of the land and also the change in sea levels. But nonetheless, broadly, I think it's fair to say that the fear is that we'll see not only uh, a reduction in land area, thanks to sea level rise and inundation of the coast, but then also potentially a pulling back, shifting landwards of maritime limits, and as a result, a loss of maritime jurisdiction and rights over valuable marine resources. Baselines 
uh, that are ambulatory potentially are also fundamental to maritime boundaries. And whilst the provisions of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea don't explicitly uh, indicate a method of delimitation for a continental shelf and exclusive economic zone, nonetheless, in practice, the vast majority of boundary agreements are based on equidistance. It may be simplified or modified equidistance, but nonetheless, equidistance is the basis. And in terms of the uh, delimitation of maritime boundaries by international courts and tribunals, uh, since 2009, there's been an evolution towards the use of the so-called three-stage approach or process of maritime boundary delimitation. And the first stage of that is to start with a geometric definition of a line, an equidistance line. So where do you draw the line from? Well, this is Article 5 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and this is all you ha really have to go on. This is the default scenario. If you don't have any other type of baselines legislation, you measure your maritime claims from the low water line as marked on large scale charts, officially recognized by the coastal state. Now, this article, this provision of the convention, doesn't tell you which low water line. So there are uncertainties here. Which one? What do you mean by charts? It doesn't actually say nautical charts, but I don't think that's a difficult leap to make. It doesn't say what large scale is, it doesn't give a number, and it doesn't indicate how you officially recognize charts or not, which ones are and which ones are not. So there are uncertainties there, but the key term is low water line. Now, because this provision doesn't specify a particular low water line, the answer from a legal point of view is easy. It's up to the coastal state. It's a choice of the coastal state. Now, it's fair, I would say, that to say that we expect sea level rise to have an impact on coastlines, on baselines, and that is a retreat in the location of the coastline and the baseline from which you measure maritime jurisdiction, maritime zones. That is the logical expectation. But there are complex feedbacks to take into account between the change in sea levels and the morphology of the coastline and the near shore seabed. It's not a neutral, it's an interlocking um, feedback mechanism between the two. So the land does not stay static. So in essence, as the water rises, it doesn't simply march up the contours. It doesn't fill up like a bathtub. Also, there are interactions between changing sea level and coastal ecosystems and their ecosystem services. So certain ecosystems are capable of autonomous adaption. So mangroves are remarkable in their ability to build up land underneath themselves in order to stay in situ in the same location despite changing sea levels. Similarly, coral reefs grow. The counterpoint to that, unfortunately, is that while we have evidence from the geological record of coral reefs growing, healthy coral reefs growing at a 11 millimeters per year, that was in a, an ocean that wasn't so warm as a result of absorbing our, our excess heat, and also one that wasn't so acidic as a result of absorbing our excess carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, which make the ocean more acidic, ocean acidification. What I'll also illustrate is that some baseline, the broader the maritime zone, the less base points you need. So uh, the impacts on the outer limits of maritime claims for an exclusive economic zone are likely to be less, or the threat may be less, the risk as compared with the limits of territorial sea. This change in sea levels may also have an impact on what you can count as 
an island that is a feature that is above water, naturally formed, consisting of land uh, above water at high tide and surrounded by water. Islands are covered by Article 121 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the award of the tribunal in the South China Sea case between the Philippines and China has provided the first detailed judicial interpretation of Article 121. From a sea, sea level rise point of view, we have the potential for rising sea levels to impair or change the ability of a, a naturally formed above high tide feature of it being able to sustain human habitation or an economic life of its own, and thereby, thereby making a feature, an island, less and less habitable. That arguably could lead to an island being reclassified from a fully entitled island that can generate the full range of maritime claims to a mere quote unquote rock, which can only generate a 12 mile territorial sea or a feature to no longer be above high tide, at, uh, above water at high tide, and thereby be a low tide elevation. That is a feature that is exposed at low tide, but is completely covered at high tide, or to simply be an entirely subsurface feature, ultimate. Now here it, it's, there is some emerging regional practice, particularly in the Southwest Pacific, that is of particular note. Um, and there's been really significant efforts to delimit maritime boundaries in this region, a doubling of the number of agreed boundaries in the period 2005 to 15. So in 10 years, um, the region went from around a third of potential maritime boundaries agreed to now of the order of 75%. We even had one day where eight boundary agreements were signed in one single day at one meeting. Now, when that's set against the, the average number of maritime agreements, uh, boundary agreements, 6.4 agreements per year in between 1970 and 2004, and that was reduced to uh, 3.4 agreements a year in 2005 to 2014, then getting eight boundary agreements uh, signed on one day is remarkable progress. And there've also been, there's also been significant um, efforts on the part of Pacific Island states, particularly towards fixing baselines, limits, and boundaries. So this is the part of the world we're talking about. Um, and you see the red lines are agreed maritime boundaries in this region. Uh, and those states shaded in light blue are the ones that have declared the location of their baselines, limits and boundaries to the United Nations Secretary General through the United Nations Division of Ocean Affairs and the Law of the Sea in order to establish the breadth of their existing maritime entitlements so that it doesn't change in the future as a result of climate change inspired sea level rise. So an example of that is uh, the Marshall Islands. The legislation is only a few pages long. The declaration that goes with it is 451 pages long. And the reason for that is that um, it really is taking what is a geographical information systems file and turning it into a legal text. So defining all of the baselines, delineated the, all of the outer limits and agreed maritime boundaries in red. The outer limits here, 200 mile zone in uh, uh, yellow here. So how do you define in a text, what is an arc, a curve? Well, what you do is you take the arc and you divide it up into straight lines. So you define a point, and you define a point and you join it up with a straight line called a chord. And for this um, declaration, the distance between the true arc and the chord that represents it through straight lines and coordinates is less than one meter. 
If you're going to achieve that for a 200 mile limit, you need a lot of coordinates, which is why it's 451 pages long. Now, just this last weekend, uh, the P Pacific Islands Forum Leaders Ocean Statement for 2021 became available, and it makes for interesting reading. Now, the Pacific Island states now articulate their maritime spaces as the so-called Blue Pacific or Blue Pacific continent, blending the idea of land and the maritime. But really, for these states, they are small island, but large ocean. And they, there have been a series of declarations in the last few years, since, really since the advent of the Pacific Oceanscape in 2010. Pacific leaders have again and again indicated we want our existing maritime claims to be respected regardless of sea level rise. So for the Pacific, Blue Pacific continent to be realized, sea level rise and climate change is the defining issue. Here, the express intention is commitment to a collective effort, including the development of international law. So there we see the potential for a change and evolution in international law of the sea, with the aim of ensuring that maritime zones of these states are delineated in accordance with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea um, in a way that cannot be challenged or reduced as a result of sea level rise and climate change. So the traditional understanding of ambulatory baselines and therefore potentially shifting outer limits to maritime claims, we're seeing pressure from threatened states. And this is a threat not just for the small island developing states, large ocean states of the Pacific, but every coastal state, including uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, uh, Philippines, all of the states that are involved in this, this uh, uh, course, including Ghana. Um, you know, all of these uh, coastal states are threatened in the same way. This is a, a global issue. Some are threatened more than others because of the, the spatial variability of the phenomenon of sea level rise and also whether they have low elevation coastlines which are highly populated or not. This kind of effort admission on a regional basis fits in and aligns with the International Law Association Committee on Sea Level Rise uh, Resolution. Uh, and I'm a, a member of, of that particular committee. But on the grounds of legal certainty and stability, then the outer limits of maritime zones that are delineated in keeping with the convention uh, should not be required to be recalculated should sea level change change the geographical reality of the coast. That marks a major shift if that is agreed and accepted by other states, then you have a scenario like this. You have land and the ocean, you freeze the baseline what the, the legal representation of where the coast is through the baseline, and you define your 12 nautical mile limited territorial sea and 200 mile limited EZ, and then we have sea level rise. And again, funky graphics, thank you to Andy. The problem there though, is that you have an expanded area of internal waters, your baseline no longer represents the physical location of the coast. And one of the principles of the international law of the, law of the sea is that the land dominates the sea. And the International Court of Justice um, articulated that viewpoint in 1969, that the land dominates the sea. You need land territory to generate maritime claims. And in, in this scenario, you would see increasingly a divergence between the location of the land and the actual base that is, is representing the land. However, I, I tend to believe that that's a preferable option compared to the alternative of fixing the limits. So if you fix the territorial sea limit, and again, you had sea level rise, whilst the baseline would retreat, 
the outer limit to territorial sea would remain fixed. And therefore, you'd end up with a territorial sea that is greater than 12 nautical miles from your baselines. That's an overt breach of the provisions of the convention. And equally, if you fix the limit of the EEZ, you would have the same problem would occur. So I think we're now in an era of evolution in the applicable international law. However, there are um, counter narratives to this. It's not clear yet that other states will accept declared limits and boundaries, they sign the limits and boundaries, and it's unclear to my mind how international courts and tribunals will treat this type of issue. So going back to that Bangladesh India arbitration case, that is one of the few cases that has, has really dealt with the challenge of climate change inspired sea level rise because Bangladesh has a highly unstable coastline. Uh, the uh, Ganges Brahmaputra river system that exits at the delta on Bangladesh's coastline generates enormous volumes of sediment that builds up the coastline, builds new islands every year. And then storm activity, monsoon activity, uh, trims back and erodes those islands and that coast on an annual basis, it's a seasonal basis. But there is the challenge of climate change inspired sea level rise. And Bangladesh raised that argument in this, this particular case. However, the tribunal took the view that the argument was not relevant because essentially the tribunal wasn't interested where the coastline was historically and not interested in how uh, it would be impacted by climate change in years or centuries to come. Its job was narrow. Its job was to determine base points on the coast now at the time of the delimitation uh, and to see whether it was feasible to draw a line on that basis. And that tribunal referenced back to the International Court of Justice judgment in the Black Sea case between Ukraine and Romania, um, where the court said that um, the, the way in which the line should be constructed at the first stage of the three-stage process was geometric, based on the geography of the coast at the time of delimitation. I think one of the lessons here is for coastal states to try and accelerate their efforts to delimit maritime boundaries while their coastline is in place and not necessarily to rely on courts to do it for them. Because arguably on the basis of this case, even though um, there are some very positive aspects in the way in which the tribunal indicated that maritime boundaries should be stable in the same way as land boundaries have traditionally been under international law. It proved itself to be, in my mind, at least partially blind to climate change impacts. It was only concerned with the now, not with the potential for impacts into the future. So at this point, we are um, to, right. Question for Mr. Moderator, Andy, if you're you're still with me, um, do you want to take a break or for a brief stretch of the legs and cup of coffee? And what we, in in Swedish terms, the first word of Swedish I ever learned is fika. It means going for coffee and cake. Andy, do you want to break now or shall we carry on? It seems that Andy has already gone for a break. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> uh, what I would you like to do? Probably break, if break is not really like a break. Probably we want to have probably with the, uh, with the participant. 
What do you think about that? Yeah, I can I can take if, questions if now. Want to or, ask or, your question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, any right. questions already arising, and then we'll move on to issues of surrounding technology. Thank you, thank you very much, Clive. Uh, uh, you know what happened is that uh, it feels uh, to me that I would like to take another PhD again. By attending your lecture. Yeah, as hobbies go, Andy, that's probably not one to go for. <laughs> All right. Is there is there any or if uh, sorry, Clive? Do you, how much do you have uh, uh, left? By the way, uh, good question. Um, <laughs> I am at slide forty-two out of sixty-five. All right. All right. Uh, you might need to. I want to a little bit faster in some slides. I think it's you can okay. just can go. No problem. Please continue. Okay. I am happy to do that. Please. Uh, particularly as I don't see any um, hands up. Yes. So, uh, I, I will accelerate then. I, another theme I wanted to, to draw out was the issue of technology. Um, and the difficulties I said at the beginning is that we tend to think in a myopic, narrow um, way. We're quite limited in how we, we think about change um, and we struggle with exponential change. Um, the Example that was uh, how it de was demonstrated to me was a uh, goldfish bowl. You put one marble in, then you put two marbles in, then four marbles in, and it takes forever to get to even a quarter full, and then it's half full and it's full. You get ambushed by the rapidity of change when it's exponential in character. And this is demonstrated, there are great examples of how uh, deterministic, how people have thought that we've, we, basically we've, we've done it all. There's no more technology to worry about. And there's no more inventions. So a, one of the chief uh, engineers of the Roman Empire in the, just in, the, in uh, year two, uh, Anna Domini, um, said, inventions have long since reached their limits. I see no hope of further development. That's 2000 years ago, 2019 years ago. Um, one of the fathers of computer science, modern computer science in 1949, said that he thought computer science had reached its limits. Thomas Watson, who is one of the founders of IBM, computer giant, his, um, what he envisaged for the company was that maybe there would be a need across the world for maybe five or six computers. Bill Gates, Microsoft founder, he didn't think there would be any need for more than 125K of memory in a computer. These are very clever people, but deeply misguided about technological change. We think in a linear way, and we are seeing major ongoing technological revolutions in terms of three examples, nanotechnology, miniaturization of things, biotechnology and genetics, and certainly in information technology through robotics, for example. Um, there are an AI. Um, there are major changes coming. One example with a view to boundary delimitation, both on land and maritime, is uh, Geo information of, in a way, our geoscientific approaches to detecting the Earth from space, of satellite mapping and the applications of that. In the maritime context, the, the advent of satellite derived C4 mapping and morphology, of being able to see with high accuracy into the water column, can be extremely useful from a point of view of detecting change in the coastline and therefore with a view to defining the location of the coast and baselines. Now, I know you'll have, be having discussion on archipelagic states. Uh, I and a colleague, David Freestone, uh, there's a um, new article we have out in Ocean Yearbook uh, looking at archipelagic states and sea level rise. One of the states we look at is Jamaica. Not the most obvious archipelagic state, um, but it is an archipelagic state uh, it qualifies under the rules. 
uh, because of these small features to the south, Southwest Rocks, Lower Rock, uh, and the, the, the Pedro Cays in here on the Pedro Bank and the Morant Cays. The rules under Article 47 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea for an archipelagic state is that there's a, there's a test. There's an objective test called a ratio test. You need to capture as much water as you have land territory and up to nine times as much water as you have land territory to fulfill the test. Now, Jamaica, because of the existence of these small features, qualifies and captures about twice as much water as there is land territory. But those features at the south are small and low elevation. So they are potentially susceptible to changing sea level. Particularly where you have uh, coral caves like this, this is Pedro Banks, uh, where fishermen use as a base for uh, fishing on that area. You're dealing with a, a low elevation coral cave, which is dependent on the sediment produced by the coral reefs uh, for its survival above high tide. When you look and use satellite derived seafloor morphology, you can get these wonderful images of what the the near shore morphology or shape of the seabed looks like. And that can be a very useful for looking at a threat assessment in the context of sea level rise. Uh, another example, this is in Saudi Arabia, an unsurveyed bay, but at progressively higher uh, resolutions of satellite. Uh, so on the far right, we've got uh, sub centimeter, so sub meter imagery you can gain a very clear impression of what the, the sea floor of that bay actually looks like in reality. And I'm not picking on, the, on Vietnam here, but this is part of uh, Vietnam's um, straight baseline system. And you can see that the baseline turning points, well, they kind of miss sometimes. They miss the land. So when you look at the um, satellite-derived imagery, you can gain a much better impression of where the base points should be. And in discrepancies of over a kilometer, you could move your, uh, you should move your, in this case, your baseline backwards or over here forwards, advance it in order, in order to improve your baseline model of where your coastline actually is. The point I'd like to make here with, in relation to this satellite derived technology in the context of the limitation of both land and maritime boundaries is that a shared technical understanding can often provide a major confidence building mechanism. If both sides are, are working from the same technical basis, using the same technologies and no asymmetries between the two sides, then it can be extremely valuable uh, as a basis to facilitate the reaching of an agreement on a land or maritime boundary. In the South uh, Pacific, for example, all of those agreements I, I just talked about, there's a re been a regional approach, um, supported by Australia, supported by New Zealand, the Commonwealth Secretariat, Grid Arendal from, from Norway, um, there to provide not only an annual forum where countries could come together for capacity building on the technical side, but also an opportunity to talk to one another year on year to provide a forum for diplomatic exchange for negotiation of maritime boundaries and to provide a level playing field in technical terms so that one state doesn't feel disadvantaged against another state in terms of the fundamental geotechnical aspects of delimitation. And I know that you'll have a, a, a further lecture or two on technical aspects, geospatial aspects of boundary management uh, in the course of the summer school. Yeah, that's fine. I would also say, look, as I mentioned at the beginning, mm -hmm. management of terrestrial and maritime space tends to be bounded defined by lines and points. Mm. Uh, in the ocean context, oceans are increasingly uh, busy places. 
a greater diversity of activities and a greater intensity of activities. Where I am now, you know, in the north, if you go into the North Sea in Northern Europe, traditionally this was a space for fishing. And this is part of the problem with, with most marine spatial planning exercises is that the fishermen used to have access to everywhere and any efforts to define areas for other uses or for conservation tend to lead to the fishermen having less. And therefore the fishermen don't, don't see a, a, a positive outcome uh, because you're constraining where they can go. But we traditionally talked about integrated coastal zone management in the 1980s and 90s. That's in a way evolved into marine spatial planning that has become more and more popular as a way to try and reconcile competing interests. Uh, in the North Sea, you will see not only fishing activities, but oil and gas activities, military activities, and increasingly large, large scale offshore uh, renewable energy in the form of huge wind turbines. That's an example of a new activity competing for space offshore. Mm. There are also, at the global level, there are targets for the conservation and sustainable use of the oceans and land in terms of protecting and conserving representative portions of ecosystems. And that offshore is uh, done through marine protected areas. So as an example, to give you an idea of oceans as busy places, mm -hmm. this is the space between uh, England and Ireland. So the, as far as the English are concerned, it's called the Irish Sea. So as the Irish are concerned, it's called the Celtic Sea. Uh, but you can see all of these overlapping and intersecting activities which may be complementary, but often also can compete with one another in the same space. And that's the point behind undertaking a marine spatial planning exercise. The difficulty of them, or the controversial aspect to them, is uh, being able to reconcile the differences between competing interests of different stakeholders. That's what makes them hard to achieve. In terms of marine protected areas, well, one of the very early examples from 1975 is the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Um, there, with looking at MPAs, there has been a proliferation of very large MPAs. Uh, this, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park is a multi-use park. So the majority, well, a large proportion of it is open to shipping. You can see that the actual preservation zone, i.e. where no one can go, except for very occasionally scientists, is less than 1% of the park. Um, so a complex zoning regime of different areas for different uses. Now, I do recommend once travel is actually possible again, uh, that you do visit the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Um, it has suffered multiple bleaching events as a result primarily of ocean heat. Uh, so go and see it while you can. Uh, and I wanted to throw this slide in um, because that's a baby turtle and that's my foot for, set, for scale. Um, I very much uh, recommend. I'm not on commission to Heron Island, but I, I very much enjoyed those, those trips. In terms of conservation of the marine and terrestrial environment, under the Convention on uh, Biological Diversity, uh, they articulated a target of 10% especially of uh, particular importance for biodiversity and ecosystem services, but not just the percentage, the effective management of those areas. And it's got to be equal, um, ecologically representative. And there, that was carried forward into IG uh, biodiversity target number 11 and echoed through the United Nations 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. However, if you read the scientific literature, many scientists are saying, actually, 10 percent is not enough. We need 30 percent by 2030, the 30 by 30 initiative. Mm. Uh, and we are a long way short of that, particularly um, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Less than 2 percent of areas beyond national jurisdiction have any form of uh, conservation uh, attached to them. 
so beyond uh, in the high seas. We'll get back to that in a moment. But you've seen the advent of extremely large scale marine protected areas, for example, uh, around the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And I include this simply because I learned how to say Papahana Makuakea as the, the, the name of the Hawaiian name of the, the marine protected area. Oops. But you see, for example, the Cook Islands have proposed that fully 50% of their exclusive economic zone will be a marine park. Whereas Palau, 80% of the EZ to become a, a marine protected area with only 20% as a domestic fishing zone. Although that domestic fishing zone also coincides with the area that distant water fishing vessels like to operate. So, you know, not so domestic after all. Um, but these broad scale marine protected areas give rise to criticism, to a critique are they representative? Are they well managed? Um, are they only paper parks, so called? Because we're dealing with small island developing states with limited capacity for maritime surveillance and enforcement. How are you going to police this park? It's enormous. And you have no, and for Palau, there is one patrol vessel, which is through the Australian Patrol. Uh, boat program uh, is a very old Australian, ex-Australian patrol vessel. How are you going to undertake the kind of surveillance and enforcement necessary? One of the ways to do that is through technology, use of drones, uh, use of satellite tracking. But then you have an issue, a legal issue, about the uptake of that type of evidence in proceedings. The other key critique over these large-scale parks is that some of them have been declared by former colonial states concerning their last remnants of empire. So the United Kingdom defined a, a giant park around the Chagos archipelago, which is disputed by Mauritius. Um, and the UK, uh, you know, it's very positive in an environmental and conservation sense uh, Chagos has been described as the other Galapagos on the planet, um, but it's a way in which the UK was undertaking an act of administration to assert its right to declare a marine uh, protected area around th those features. Similarly, the UK has done so around Pitcairn Islands, the French. Um, the French don't have dependencies. You, you have... Uh, all of the, the leftover parts of empire for France are integral parts of France. And therefore, if you, you step into uh, French Polynesia or New, New Caledonia or um, Martinique or Guadeloupe uh, in the Caribbean uh, or Réunion in the Indian Ocean, you're entering the European Union because you're entering France. So if ever you are in a quiz and the, the question is, which country in the world has the most time zones, it's not Russia, it's France. As a result of having those scattered possessions across the planet. Now these states, these extra regional states are defining broad marine protected areas. Yes, for a conservation purpose. Yes, to fulfill that, that, those targets, percentage targets under uh, CBD and under um, SDG 14, but also to assert their right to do so for geopolitical reasons. Now, this kind of um, thing, to my mind, leads to more and more lines in the sea, um, more and more borders, and it can take place at uh, a national level, as we've just seen, but also a sub-national level. And again, these graphics are thanks to Andy, and you, Andy can um, update us on really <laughs> the way in which um, the devolution has proceeded or not proceeded in the Indonesian context, where rights are handed over to the provinces, but also to the regencies, and whether that's still the case, and whether uh, there is a proliferation there of internal subnational lines in the on land and let's see we need to which have meaning in terms of uh, management 
of those spaces. So they're significant. And then we turn to probably the most exciting thing for my international legal colleagues of, over the last few years has been the creation of, uh, and I'm sorry to inflict acronyms galore on you, but an ILBI, an internationally legally binding instrument for biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, so BBNJ, in ABNJ, so areas beyond national jurisdiction. Here we have the Clip Clarion Clipperton Rise. So we have the international seabed area, all of the brightly colored blocks are leased by the International Seabed Authority, but the green squares are sort of reserved areas of protected, uh, of particular interest mm. for, in order for there not to be seabed mineral extraction and exploration. So defined area-based management tools, which is one of the mechanisms that is under consideration in the BBNJ discussions that are still ongoing at the United Nations. I think we had three sessions of the intergovernmental um, uh, conference, uh, and still there is a fourth session to come and maybe more, depending on, on how the progress is. And that's so exciting for our international legal colleagues, because this is the creation of an internationally legally binding instrument, a treaty related to about 60% of the surface of the ocean, where previously there has been no specific management regime. So it's hugely potentially significant for the management of our planet. Conclusion. Well, is it a board going to, are we heading towards a borderless world? Are we retracting from a borderless world that we had before to, to some extent? Yes, we're seeing a, a reassertion of that barrier or uh, barrier function of borders. Uh, I think the climate change and climate crisis uh, have a, uh, an enormous impact, certainly on land and definitely the oceans, which is my primary area of interest as well have been plain, um, since most of my examples are rather wet. Um, I think on a, in the course of the summer school, you have multiple contributions dealing with law and policy. Never forget that law and policy are created by politicians, so you can never get away from the political dimension. And also within boundary delimitation and management, I always say, think of it as a triangle. You have the, you, yes, you need the lawyers to draft the agreement, the treaty. You need the geographers and geotechnicians, the surveyors to produce a line that you can then find again. You need the technical component to the agreement. But ultimately, both of those components are subsidiary to the political component. You need political authority to enter into an agreement between states, particularly. I do think we're seeing uh, a progressive evolution in international law and the law of the sea in particular, or I hope we are in terms of uh, baselines, limits and boundaries for the sake of small island, large ocean states. And we're seeing technology shifting rapidly and that has major implications, particularly the satellite-based geospatial technologies that we, we have now. I, I think we have progressed extremely far in terms of our positioning technology, mm. but not just horizontally. We're moving towards a global unified um, height uh, regime. And we, once you can combine those two, the horizontal positioning and the vertical, then you, you have real input potentially into uh, baselines and climate change impacts on low water lines into the future. So the technologies are improving all the time. We sometimes underestimate how fast those changes can occur. And I think that um, this is a, a, an incredibly timely focus for the summer school because borders are always being reimagined into the future. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. And I hope much. I wasn't more than an hour or two over, over time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Clive. Very, very insightful uh, lecture that you had. Thank you very much once again.
Uh, we already have a couple of questions uh, for you, Clive. I think I'll just read it from the chat box at the moment before we allow some to ask question directly. I think you somehow also can read this, uh, but I'll, I'll just read yeah. it for you. Uh, yeah, I'll question. rely on you, Andy. And, uh, and yeah, please, please. I, ideally, it's a real tragedy that we, we've been trapped in Zoom for the last 18 months and we haven't been able to actually converse face to face and yeah. whilst there has been that proliferation of webinars and online things, it mm. steals from you the chance to network together face to face and to be able to interact with the 22 professors that you're going to have wheeled in on Zoom. So it's a, it's a real shame that that's, that's the case, but in our, uh, this type of scenario, mm. uh, please ask the questions yourselves. Um, All right. <laughs> rather than I think that's the way to go way to go Andy. Okay. if you can referee who that would right. be great um, and then we get a, a little bit of a conversation going okay that's very good very good uh, we should really uh, utilize this opportunity right to to talk actually to people uh, Nadira are you here are you are you comfortable to ask question directly to Clive yes yes I'm here Please, please, if you... Okay, uh, so, uh, uh, okay, so Professor Clive, I have a question. Regarding the baseline or maritime boundaries, uh, it could change due to the climate change and also increasing sea level, etc. But how about the embankment work or land mounts, uh, or in Malaysia we call it as uh, tambak, tambak tanah? upon the land. So with this activity, we'll expand the right to? Very yes, thank you. <laughs> Good question. Andy, can you uh, elaborate for me what this, this type of feature is? Uh, is basically... Uh, sea uh, mounds or not? Yeah, yeah, like the sea, yeah, embankment. And also uh, basically to extend the, uh, the coast due to right. the land basically from the inside uh, part of the part of the land yeah well we what we have have known for centuries now is that the coastline is dynamic um, and is influenced by a whole range of natural processes mm -hmm. um, the most obviously is, is uh, having a delta and uh, the sediment flow down the river an extension of the, the coastline gradually offshore and then it gets uh, trimmed back by erosive forces so you've got a constant war between depositional forces and and er erosive forces mm. uh, I think what we tend to expect even though there are complex feedbacks between land and sea with rising sea levels an elevated base uh, base on which storm action which we expect to become more intense and more frequent mm. then as well as having rising sea level, you, you've got um, enhanced erosive forces. So you're, you, you have the potential for substantial changes to the coastline as a consequence of that. I, I don't know about those specific embankments, but mm. for example, in the Arctic, you mm. have, which is a very different environment, I admit, um, you have some of the highest rates of coastal erosion because the coat for two factors, the coastline itself has a high ice content. Mm -hmm. so it's made up of permafrost. So as the atmosphere warms, it's losing its, its structural integrity because the ice is melting. And secondly, traditionally in recent centuries, the coastline has been predominantly ice locked. Mm. So no open water, therefore no waves. Right. So now we're getting a, a coastline that is exposed to wave action for the first time in millennia. So you're seeing erosion rates of the order of 20 or 30 meters a year mm. in some areas where you have soft coastline. The same idea can apply to soft sedimentary coastlines where you where you're, have a depositional system and a higher rate of sediment transport and erosion, mm -hmm. then you will end up with significant impacts on the coast. Right. So I would be concerned. Okay. Uh, but I remember equally, our... you need to look at the specific dynamics of that particular part of the coastline. Right. And that's where some of the broad commentaries you see that 
one meter of sea level rise equals this many million Bangladeshis having to move. Mm. That's what's called bathtub modeling, where you're you're not paying attention to the specifics of the uh, coastal dynamics, particularly the coastal ecosystem dynamics. Mm. So have have some caution about mm. broad statements for specific parts of the coastline. Well, if I remember, we had a conversation about islands in the Pacific. So we usually talk about uh, losing land due to the sea, uh, sea level rise, but there's a case where the land is actually and was actually en enlarging due to sea yep. elevation yep. or a coral reefs. Is it? Can you have a comment? Yeah, I know. It, well, it, it, I, I'm not a climate skeptic, clearly, but some of the evidence goes against what you would expect. Uh, we know that the, the Pacific Island states, uh, parts of them at least, are experiencing sea level rise at three times the global average. Yet at the same time, there are reports based on photographic evidence, so it only goes back to, well, the Second World War. There's, there's fantastic aerial photography of the Pacific Islands dating back to the Second World War, thanks to the Americans. Um, and you can imagine why. Um, essentially, it's for bombing. Um, and when you compare that, that aerial photography from the 1940s through to recent satellite imagery, you can see that certain coral islands are persistent. Uh, that many are persistent and looking at the coral line, they may well have migrated and changed in location on the top of the overall reef flat. Mm. They, you know, they are dynamic features. They're, they're fed by the coral sediment system right. uh, and the flow of the sediment, the availability of coralline sand. Mm. But many of them have actually grown rather than Trim been right. trimmed back yeah. and disappeared as a consequence of sea level rise. Now that's, in a way, it's evidence of the ability of coral reefs to autonomously adapt and grow. But the uncertainty in that context is, can coral reefs continue to do so in a warmer ocean and a more acidic ocean and with more and more pressure on the reef system? Because this, this is the unpopular part of the narrative that uh, you don't want to blame the, the victim, but increasing urbanization and population and pollution mm. on coral reefs is also part of the problem. And it inhibits the ability of the natural system to actually respond yes. autonomously. Thank you, we are the problem, humans. <laughs> uh, next, Robert Sanders, are you here, still here? Hi, hello, yes. Uh, please, please ask a question that way. Um, yeah, so I was very struck by the conversation on um, borders with like the ocean because it's supposed to be blue. But what about how does that change with artificial islands that um, weren't there, but suddenly countries just to strengthen their claim over these jurisdictions, they put them there to try and complicate the conversation. How does that, I mean, I imagine that has some ecological effects and also some international law. Effects. Absolutely. How, how do we read that? And is there an effective remedy? Well, it, 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 that's a really great question. Thank you. And the, from an international law point of view, if you, you can build your own island, um, but you need to do so within your own maritime zone. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, the, the South China Sea Tribunal Award is, strictly speaking, of course, only binding on the Philippines and China. China doesn't think so. <laughs> Regardless of that, it is the, the, the only detailed interpretation of the regime of islands, and it does also touch on artificial island building, because, because large-scale artificial island building in the South China Sea has undoubtedly occurred, not only by China, but no one else has done it so, so extensively or so quickly. Um, other coastal states have certainly undertaken similar measures. There, if you build an artificial island, mm. it doesn't have the character of a naturally formed feature. So the maximum maritime claim that an artificial island installation or structure can generate is 500 meters safety zone, in keeping with Article 60, Paragraph 8. 
So it's not a naturally formed feature, which is a requirement for islands or rocks. Rocks are a, a disadvantaged subcategory of island in my view. They still have to be naturally formed, made of land, surrounded by water and above high tide. So those four requirements. But naturally formed is critical there. Right. What you're potentially, the, the air, gray area you can see there though is what if you've got a small feature that's above high tide, fulfills all mm -hmm. those criteria, naturally formed, surrounded by water, etc., mm -hmm. and then you start building around it? Well, that's not an artificial island. It's reclamation mm -hmm. around a right. naturally formed feature. Right. Fine. Well, the tribunal in the South Island Sea case was clear and explicit that you can't upgrade features. So you can't upgrade an, a part of the seabed and make it an island capable of generating maritime claims other than a safety zone. Equally, you can't, as it were, upgrade the status of a rock which cannot sustain human habitation or an economic life of its own, consistent with Article 121, Paragraph 3, into a fully entitled island that can then claim an EEZ and the continental shelf. So whilst you can undertake reclamation activity around the feature, you can't change the legal status of an island feature. Ah. One issue around artificial islands though, I mean, China has received an awful lot of criticism around its artificial island building. Yes, and I think that that is in large part justified in the sense that it has it's effectively destroyed atolls by uh, piling up destroying the lagoon area, crunching up the sand uh, with a, a giant uh, dredger, uh, hoovering up that aggregate and sand through floating pipelines and piling up, up on the edge of the, the atoll to smother it. Mischief Reef, well-named, is, is the classic example of that. And clearly that uh, mm -hmm. is a breach of the general obligation on all coastal states and parties to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea to protect and preserve the marine environment under Article 192. However, this, it's the same kind of technology that has been used mm. to make Singapore 25% bigger than it was <laughs> three decades ago. It's the same technology that the Maldives has used to build up what was an, an naturally occurring above high tide feature into a large, in excess of three meter vertically above sea level feature mm. called the city, which will host a city called Hope. Already there are 50,000 people living there, projected 240,000 people living on that largely artificial island, but it's, it's not actually, it's reclamation, right. um, in order to provide in a way, a large physical floating, or well not floating, physical lifeboat right. in, to combat the threat of uh, sea level rise right. impact. Any, uh, fundamentally from a uh, geoengineering point of view, any large, hard engineering structure like that, be it a, a seawall, be it a, mm. any kind of sea defense or uh, to the all the way up to building uh, large artificial or semi-artificial islands, right. um, that necessarily has substantial potential knock-on effects, unanticipated and unwelcome impacts, because you're messing with the natural circulation system. Right. You're interrupting sediment flow to other parts of the coastline. So where you, where you build a sea defense, you often end up with uh, erosion elsewhere on your coast. Okay. Classic example of this is the North Sea. Mm. I'm sorry to tear you away from the Asia Pacific again, um, but sea defences on the east coast of the United Kingdom, of East Anglia and England, ended up starving the circulatory system in the North Sea of mm. the sediment that supplies the beaches on the Belgian, Netherlands, German coastlines. So the Dutch are the past masters at reclamation. They have mm. constructed the wonderfully named Zand Motor, which is a huge deposit of sand at right. one end of their coastline, expressly with the intent of feeding the natural system, mm. of eroding away and feeding all of the coastline. 
to use the natural circulation to support the stability of the coastline. Right. So using naturally based processes, even if you're intervening by providing se sediment supply. But the lesson is that, you know, if you build uh, an in hard structure, mm. you end up with uh, environmental damage inevitably, which is where you need an environmental impact assessment. Thank you, Clive. Uh, we're scheduled until 16.30 of our time, which is like two minutes from now, but I think we, have, uh, we still have two very interesting and good questions. Uh, in short, I think you can help to answer this. Uh, Bagas Tewan, are you here? Do you want to ask uh, the question directly to Professor Clive Uh Okay. Uh, can, can you hear my voice? Yes, yes, yep. please. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you for the, the time. And I will ask about a fisherman. Uh, as mm -hmm. you said before, that the climate change will change the ecosystem of the ocean. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it will cause uh, some fish will look for another place for to live uh, and and they will change their habit habitat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would like to know, what do you think when a fisherman is uh, who only fishing at a place with many fish, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they do not know where the boundary is because the location of the fish is different from before. And, yeah. and uh, especially it, it will cause the traditional fisherman. Uh, I think okay. that's all my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that, that's, that, that's quite a profound question from the, and it goes back to the very start of the discussion. Hmm. The climate change impacts will produce problems which in turn produce pressure on population movement, either internally displacement or internationally because it, it threatens food security. Um, if the fish are no longer there and they've migrated either to another part of your country or beyond uh, uh, your maritime spaces into another coastal state, another region of the planet, then you have a real problem. You either need to, need, need to change what you catch mm. or you need to move. And that is, is one of the impacts of climate change on the oceans is that shift in the location of stocks, my changes in the distribution of species mm. inevitably has impacts on livelihoods and food security. Uh, and the tragedy is that it, that's likely to be more keenly felt uh, in developing countries than it is in the global north. And that's not a satisfactory answer. Mm. Uh, the only the only sort of way I'd, I'd give uh, a certain degree of hope is, is um, the shift in species into the Arctic Ocean mm -hmm. um, is probably the only instance of the precautionary principle being actually properly applied to fisheries because there's a moratorium on that new area for fishing. We traditionally mm -hmm. haven't fished there and we're not going to fish there for the moment. Uh -huh. And therefore, you know, you're going to wait and see, you know, whether that it's feasible to do so, is wise to do so, etc. Uh, unfortunately, we we have come up with principles, ecosystem-based management, precautionary approach to to activity, which are really hard to implement in practice when we have a long, long history of just this sort of exploitative yes. uh, activity. And there's a limit to what the artisanal uh, fishing communities can actually do to um, to change that mm. scenario. Although what I would say in context is often local communities are maybe dependent on uh, reef fish, for example, rather than the large commercial stocks uh, such as tuna, tuna-like species that the commercial fishing sector is actually concerned with. So we, we need to disaggregate and unpack what the, the impacts of whether they're local or, or more um, broadly regional. Thank you, Brian. So scale matters. True. But I would, a geographer would say that. 
We have one last question from uh, Patricia. Is it correct? Yes. Thank, thank you, Andy, and hi, Professor Clef. Uh, I want to right. ask about: Is there any effective sanction for state who fail to protect the biodiversity diversity and marine living? Since, uh, let's say, for example, the state is the member of UNCLOS, but uh, the state uh, didn't ratify the Convention on Marine Protection. Thank you very much. Well, dealing with international law, um, uh, the, one of the criticisms of the South China Sea arbitration, for example, is that there's no enforcement mechanism. So it really depends on politics again, uh, and it depends on the degree to which uh, states are willing to be wanting to be seen as uh, following the rules-based order or not right. of uh, their their international relations with their fellow states as whether they want to be seen as an outlier to that or and a rule breaker or one that is um, acceding to the, the the global good and the global commons to try and act in a responsible way and that's really how the global climate change regime is working, nationally determined contributions to, in terms of cuts in emissions, is down to the states themselves. But the, there is genuine global pressure from states, fellow members of the international community, to reach those targets. Mm. So coming from Australia, where the government um, is in the pocket of the coal industry and is is climate blind um there is still there is major pressure politically geopolitically on australia to change its tune and i think we will will see that um but um there isn't a way to enforce matters no mm. okay so uh, but is there maybe any uh like the in the international law doctrine, there is the principle of unwilling and unable. So, if there is a state who is uh, unable to protect the marine diversity and uh, bioprotection, is there any possibility that, let's say, in the ASEAN, uh, in the ASEAN uh, area, is there any possibility that any other countries may interfere with? Uh, with the issue uh, potentially and you know uh, I, I would probably I, I will be I will deflect this one to the international uh, legal scholars who will come after me to some okay. extent because the, there is the, the there is increasing discussion about climate change related litigation right. uh, and whether that is possible under international law um, in terms of other states interfering, yes, yeah. there's always the possibility that your neighbors may not um, um, do things that you believe are uh, correct within what you regard as your waters. But I believe later in the, in the uh, summer school, um, Dr. Rasana will be dealing with the number of overlapping maritime claims and maritime boundary disputes uh, within the region. Because we have such a young system of offshore boundaries, particularly, we have an enormous number of overlapping claims, some of which are ill-defined, mm. um, and therefore you have competing rights within those spaces. I would say there that the, uh, the provisions on mm. um, maritime delimitation for the continental shelf and exclusive economic zone and paragraph three of those provisions, there you have an obligation of conduct that yeah. states um, should not jeopardize or hamper the reaching of an agreement and should not undertake activities that are likely to prevent an agreement occurring. And that those obligations have been elaborated again through a couple of cases that are only binding on their parties, but are very informative for our understanding or, or interpretation of those provisions, and particularly the cases between Guyana and Suriname and between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire mm. around what activities you can 
undertake in disputed waters and what you cannot. Right. So broadly, from the Guyana Suriname case, if you're undertaking seismic surveying, we know physical impact on the on the continental shelf. That's probably okay. If you're drilling, then that would be con con contravening that obligation not to jeopardize and hamper the reaching of an agreement. Uh, so if your neighboring state is sailing into your, what you regard as your waters and undertaking drilling activity or action that actually impacts on the, the marine environment, then you may well have uh, the opportunity for a case, for example, for the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea. What you don't necessarily get is an ability to ensure that the state that loses the case actually um, follows the judgment. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Prof. Clive and Andy. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Well, uh, Clive, uh, thank you very much for a very insightful lecture and also very good uh, conversation that we had. I will not conclude anything because we are going to have more lectures to come, but I hope everybody is happy, but not satisfied. <laughs> I mean, if you're satisfied, you'll just stop here, right? So happy, but not satisfied. So you will attend uh, different 20 more classes to come. Uh, one day, Clive, long time ago, we, we say, uh, the sky is the limit. And then later we say, the imagination is only the limit. Now we have to reimagine the limit. So I think that's <laughs> wonderful. Very good. So ladies and gentlemen, I think let us uh, give a big round of applause to uh, Professor Clive Scoville. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you very much also, Hasmi. Thank you very much, Hasmi. Now I'll give it back to uh, Chika and Gustav, please. Thank you, Pak Andy, for accompanying our speakers and participants in today's session. That's true, Gustav. This is the end of today's agenda. Again, we would like to Thank all participants. We also apologize for any misconduct both in our action or statement as your master of ceremony. Thank you so much. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon and, and see you tomorrow. tomorrow. Bye, bye bye. Thank you. Clive. Thank you so much, Clive. Thanks. Thank you, Antman and Andy. Pat. Pleasure. Andre. <laughs> bye, Hasmi. Bye. <laughs>